Nobody wants to be a bad entrepreneur, a, a crappy leader, a horrible marketer. Most people don't have a clue what greatness is supposed to feel like, express like. So you need to model people that have it, first of all. So now you figure out what they are, what greatness looks like, and it doesn't have to be the peak, but you model people in your life or that you've observed that manifest those different attributes. And then you correlate it to where you are and you look at the gap. So you got to figure out what's the safest way to do it. You don't have to be Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett or Elon Musk. You can be great relative to who and where you are in your life. What up, it's Mr. X to the Z exhibit. What's up, guys? It's Andy for selling. This is your boy, Frau Monk. This is Ryan Serhant. This is Shingy. Hi, it's Patrick McGibbon. Sonia Zarvitani. This is Director X. Hey, everybody, I'm Forbes Riley. Yo, this is Goldie. This is Amberly Lago. This is Chris Voss. Michael Francis here. Yo, this is Charlie Tuna. Hey, what's up? It's Billy Jean. And you're listening to the Run GPG podcast. Well, I'm going to go hang out and listen to David's next podcast from the Run GPG. You might hear something you like. Peace. Jay Abraham, the $21.7 billion man, is a proven business leader, a top executive coach, and one of the highest paid marketing consultants in the world. As founder and CEO of the Abraham Group, Jay has spent his entire career solving complex problems and fixing underperforming businesses. He has significantly increased the bottom lines of over 10,000 clients in more than 8,000 industries and sub-industries worldwide. Jay has dealt with virtually every type of business scenario and issue and solved almost every type of business question, challenge, and opportunity. Jay, it's an absolute honor. Welcome to the Run GPG podcast. Thank you very much, David. And you said something already that I want to make a note of. It is a pleasure, privilege to be here. And, and while your uh, listeners don't know this, you and I have been talking offline and you're fascinating and a very deep thinker. And I'm actually already enormously impressed with your mind and your uh, really interesting slant on your market in the world. So this is going to be interesting. I'm thrilled. <laughs> Thanks for those words, Jay. But this is not about me. This is about Jay Abraham. Uh, and and as I was telling you before, you know, being excited to have you on the show for more than a minute. You know, I was telling Brian there, you're obviously a marketing and branding goat, as we say, the goat, you know, greatest of all time. Your body of work is beyond impressive. You're a thought leader. You have a standalone pedigree of working and mentoring uh, some of the most successful business builders and entrepreneurs on the planet. Uh, just to name a few, you know, you've worked with people like Tony Robbins, uh, Damon John, Brian Tracy, Stephen Covey, many more, not to mention the many companies and, and brands you've consulted for. We were talking about that off camera, right? So, you know, the question is, where do you start a conversation with someone like Jay Abraham? And I wanted to begin by just getting a little context, you know, for what made you the top executive coach that you are and one of the highest paid marketing consultants on the on the planet, really. Where did the entrepreneurial journey begin for you, your marketing uh, journey begin? And how did you become, as we say, mentor to the mentors? Maybe a brief autobiography on what got you to this point, Jay. It's, there was a movie, The Accidental Tourist, many years ago, and I would call myself the accidental marketing expert. I got married, David, the first time, and I've been married, uh, not saying this with pride, but more than one time when I was 18. I had the needs, I had two kids, the needs of uh, somebody 40 when I was 20, but the world didn't care. I had no formal education, still don't. And uh, the only people that would give me opportunity were very impressive, but very brilliantly crazy, as opposed to stupidly crazy entrepreneurs who wouldn't give me a salary, but they would give me participation and results. Sort of, you, you know, you eat what you kill. And when you only... Eat. You only eat when you earn, you figure out what works and what doesn't and what works better. But concurrently, because I was never paid for time, I had no obligatory responsibility to be anywhere from eight to five because they didn't care. They just said, OK, you make something happen, you get a piece, you don't, you don't. So I was always doing five, six, seven things concurrently to pay the rent. And after about 10 different activities, doing it for 10 different entrepreneurs, of which fortuitously, they were almost all men and women who had a penchant, 
David, for either bringing more value to a, a market that they felt was underserved or filling a void that they felt it was not being addressed. And I didn't realize it at the time, but after doing about 10 industries, I always jump not from the same industry, accidental, but fortuitously, I realized very profoundly, and it was, it was life altering for me that people in one industry don't have a clue how people in other industries think, act, transact, strategize, business model, distribution, uh, channels, uh, lead generation, conversion, selling. And I was able very much like the one-eyed man in the land of the blind to take relatively common approaches from multiple industries, integrate them, combine them, turn them into hybrids and introduce them to industries where everybody was fundamentally following the herd. And it was very exciting and I was very well uh, rewarded, but it was really almost uh, irony because I was just taking very common things that nobody knew in their industry and giving them advantage, ethical advantage, but very powerful advantage. And then as that happened, a, a big shift happened. I got bored uh, and decided to play around with training people. And we were very successful at it because I had helped all these influencers, Tony, Success Magazine, Newsletters, Entrepreneur Magazine, make a lot of money. And so they were very willing to endorse me at a, a level of accolade that most people would not give to somebody else. So they were able to say that I was, I'm not going to say superhuman, but very gifted, which I hope is a true statement. And we started getting thousands and thousands of people paying 5,000, 15,000. This is back 30 years ago when it was a lot of money. And I got bored teaching my methodology. So I started doing what I called fractal training. You're asking what got me here. I'm almost done. But this fractal training was where every time I would teach a concept, I would then make everybody in the groups who were at tables discuss an application that each company would do or each participant vote on the best one and then come to the mic and share it. So I was learning how they would interpret. And then I became hopelessly curious. And I spent years just interviewing people and asking uh, Socratic questions and trying to understand anything and everything I didn't know about didn't really matter because I had this curiosity and the combination uh, has given me a very unique, I guess, ability. I was talking, David, and then I'll shut up to some a very prominent person a couple of days ago. And we talked about the profound difference between expert knowledge and tacit knowledge. Expert knowledge, you can teach very easily. Tacit knowledge is the integrated combination of all the empirical real world experiences to still put together, process through your intuition, your critical thinking, your your ability to see pattern recognition and put it all together. And it's a very unique I probably gave you more answer than you want, but that's the short but protracted thing or, or, or process that brought me to this point where we're talking. Well, you did a great job. You know, how do you condense, you know, a lifetime of branding and marketing into uh, a brief description? Thank you for giving us some background and context. We needed that, Jay. Um, and you touched on it, you know, you know, early in your career, you did work with a few household names and you, you mentioned Entrepreneur Magazine, right? When no one knew what that word even meant, right? Yeah. You had to, correct me if I'm wrong, but you had to send out promotions and letters with the Webster's Dictionary definition right. and explanation along with phonetic yeah. uh, pronunciation yeah. of the word. Exactly. Nobody even knew how to pronounce the word. Is, when we started. Isn't that interesting? So the question is, what's the J. Abraham definition of an entrepreneur? My definition is a man or a woman who seeks to add unique and distinctive value to a market that is not being realized by anyone else. There's a really interesting, and I'm going to paraphrase it, David, but it's interesting. Peter Drucker, who a lot of entrepreneurs wouldn't have, and young ones wouldn't be aware of him, but he was, he's deceased now, but he was one of the seminal management uh, thinkers of all time. And he was a very profound man. And he had a very interesting uh, differentiation between what he called a proprietor and an entrepreneur. And his analogy was very interesting. So he said that, you know, start with, think about a deli, a delicatessen in your neighborhood. A proprietor is somebody who opens a deli, 
in an area where maybe there's a lot of other food stores. So they're trying to capitalize on the, they're trying to suck oxygen opportunistically just out of the commerce that's going on. It's a clean facility. It has reasonably attractive people working there. They are polite. The tables are clean. The, the counters are nice. You know, they've got, you know, meat and sandwiches and breads and cheeses in it. And they're cordial and they are respectful. Then he said, an entrepreneur starts out purposely thinking about what is this experience going to be like and how am I going to make it more profoundly beneficial in terms of not just the palate, but the senses, the experience, the joy, therapeutic benefit that this hour or so they spend if they're going to sit there or this sandwich that they're going to go out and take back. And, and how do I make the experience so different? So they, they think about what it looks like before you even come in. Maybe they pump the odors out of these wonderful fresh breads and cheeses and meats. They, they don't use, they pay extra for this, for a higher quality. It looks fabulous the way they purposely, strategically stack it. They, their breads are not stupid white bread that's cheap and tasteless. They go out of their way to either bake or buy uh, uh, artisan breads. They work on names for their sandwiches that are memorable and almost laughable, but just people you know, talk about. They make sure that they have proprietary, whether it's mustard or, or mayonnaise or things like that. They have signature things you memorize. The people have certain memorable phrases they use, outfits they use, things they do. And, you, and it's an experiential reprieve from the insanity of day to day. And they set out purposely trying to create that dynamic. I, I don't know if that's simplistic enough to make the differential, but that's what he said the difference was. What an incredible illustration. I love that. And thank you for unpacking that. So here's the question, Jay. Um, why and when do people, companies, and brands come to you? Uh, people come, it's, I'll tell you something ironic, and it's always saddened me. We are perhaps on the precipice of a tumultuous time in our economy. Nobody knows whether it'll be light, medium, you know, horrific. People come to me when they get stuck, stalled, stagnant, suffocate. The ironic thing is when things are going well, nobody gives us fundamentally the time of the day, which is ironic because that's the time, you know, the adage is you fix the roof before, uh, you know, while the sun shines, before it rains or sleets. But most people are arrogant, no disrespect, cocky, and, and, uh, and, overly uh, confident, and they don't realize that when things are going great is the time to experiment, to, to leverage, to, you know, to, you know, to really develop breakthrough thinking when you have plenty of time, cash flow, and uh, wiggle room. Because if you're trying to engineer breakthroughs, you know, most of the experiments, if you do it right, won't work, but you're not looking for the losers. You're looking for the one in X that explosively could grow and people don't realize that if you really want to engineer masterful growth, it's very interesting. I'm getting on a little tangent, but you can hit on this after I'm done. It's really, it needs to be an integration of two things, David, optimization and innovation. And the two are polar opposites. Optimization is about taking everything you're doing and making it do better, getting more yield from time, effort, action, investment, people, access to the market, leads that don't buy or getting more yield out of the leads, getting more yield out of buyers, inactive buyers, distribution channels, salespeople. Innovation is making all that stuff obsolete. Bridging the two is a very tricky uh, activity. So back at the ranch, they come to me now. When things stall, stagnate, when they get stuck, then they get scared and unfortunately, we thrive in a bad market and we sort of we operate in a more neutral time when things are very, very good. And it shouldn't be that way. But uh, human beings are curative. They're not really preventative. Yeah, it's interesting, Jay, because you, when you talk about those two being polar opposites, they really are. You know, innovation is not trackable. 
at the beginning. And that's why people shy away from it uh, because they don't have the numbers, right? The other part of it is trackable. We know what the ROI is on certain things because we've implemented it and it's running. Innovation is tough sometimes. It's a tough for people to change. Well, you're a really interesting uh, mind blow. The consensus is that innovation is tied to technology and it certainly can be, but it need not be. All it means to me, at least, David, is the ability to bring greater benefit, value, advantage, protection, enhancement, experience to, to a market that they recognize and value above and beyond the alternative. It can be doubling your guarantee. It can be 24-hour technology or service support. It can be a bonus nobody else gives you. It can be you know, a distinction, your VIP. I mean, that is innovation does not have to be technologically driven, although today it's been very focused on that. And it certainly should be an integrative part, but it need not be that to be innovative. I, I couldn't agree more, you know, which is great because I do want to talk about marketing specifically for a few minutes because I think it'll be valuable to break down, you know, some of the marketing concepts and strategies that you teach and talk about, especially as we head into an uncertain year for a lot of companies, sales professionals and, and service industries. Because as we were talking about off camera, regardless of what the economy does or what your company sells or provides, you know, much, if not all of what you teach and talk about is universal and unchanging because you speak to human behavior and the shopping behavior of consumers. So I, we talked at length about this and I love the topic of USPs, unique selling propositions. And I wanted to jump right into that because, you know, our company was founded on USPs. We're obsessive about using them in our marketing and branding. Um, especially in an industry like ours, which is real estate. Can you touch on the importance of articulating and integrating your unique selling proposition or propositions in everything you do as a company or service, especially for you know someone in an industry like real estate? So let me start with a fast, I'm going to come at it in a way you probably will not expect. In the world of healing, there are Wonder drugs and wonder ingredients. Penicillin was a wonder drug. Aspirin in many respects. In the marketing world, the wonder concept is what's called reason why. If you understand it, David, every decision people make, whether they, they understand it consciously or subconsciously, is predicated on two bifurcated elements of the concept of reason why. One is logical and one is emotion. The question that is nonverbal is why should I buy from you, respond to you, read your ad, anything? And if you don't have a clear cut, compelling, resonating, and impactful reason why, then you are at a very, very serious disadvantage. And throughout history, the winners knew how to articulate their advantage. And the advantage doesn't matter whether you're selling low end, high end, large, and that USP cannot be superficial. You have to live it. It has to be an integral part of your belief system, your passion, your purpose, your, your, your drive. And you know, we taught years ago, because you may or may not be as familiar with my work on uh, the strategy of preeminence, but it's, got, it's about how to elevate your company, your brand, product, service, people into the role of the only viable solution, the only choice somebody can make. And it's got a lot of elements that can take three hours to explain. But one of them is you shift your allegiance. You stop falling in love with your company being the fastest growing or the most respected. You stop falling in love with your industry and you move and fall in love with the clientele you serve and you live with an awareness of your product or service or people deployed in their life. And it's not static. Like you're in that real estate business, but you don't think, okay, I'm going to sell you a house. You think about what happens the rest of their life with that house, how you're going to either, if it's a, a family starting out, how you have just helped solidify and assure a happier, safer, more successful life for this whole family, the husband will have more joy when he comes home, more satisfaction of what he's created. The, the, the kids will be in a better 
uh, environment with more successful and and this. I mean, the property will appreciate. They're going to have more joy at night. And you think way beyond the static transaction. I don't know if I'm giving you more than you want to know. No, this is exactly it. It's, it's benefits, not features. Yeah. And, so- and, and most people don't understand that. All a feature is, if you think about it, most people are fixated. I mean, there's some real irony in life. Uh, and this is, you're not going to ask this, but I'll preempt you in an ADD uh, rogue moment. So most people, David, don't understand. Your goal in life is you want to make irresistible propositions, un- irresistible offers, unbeatable propositions, and wield and maintain and achieve absolute ethical advantage. And the reason why is almost laughable. What is the opposite of an irresistible offer or an unbeatable proposition or absolute advantage? It's a resistible offer, a beatable proposition, and total disadvantage. And people don't understand. It's very much like uh, like quantum physics. You expand or you contract. There's no such thing as stasis, really. It doesn't stay here. Mm -hmm. Listen, hearing that, and I hope everybody's paying attention uh, to hear the breakdown of unique selling propositions from the godfather of USPs, Jay Abraham himself. Um, (laughs) David, let me interrupt you, please, respectfully. Let me give you a couple of examples so it's so blatantly clear, okay? When FedEx came into the market, they redefined the whole business. And they said, when it absolutely positively has to be there, by 10 o'clock or earlier tomorrow, FedEx. Pretty simple. When Domino's Pizza first yes. came into yes. the market, it said, yes. hot, fresh, delicious pizza delivered to your door in 30 minutes or less, or it's yours free. Domino's. When, when Avis first came out, they said, we're number two. We have to be more, do more, serve more, or we won't stay in business. And when uh, Nordstrom's, which may or may not be there, it's a big uh, department store, first came in, they said, if you're dissatisfied with any merchandise you buy for any reason, any time, you can have a refund, a replacement, or a credit, no questions asked. This was long ago, and that's the essence of a USP. When I started my proposition, I have to dust it off because I haven't used it for years, was I find hidden assets, overlooked opportunities, underperforming revenue activities, undervalued, utilized resources, and I convert them to newfound windfall profits and then convert those to ongoing, recurring, uh, uh, ever compounding streams of increased profit, all for no investment or risk. Listen, I, I, I'm glad you brought up those examples. I, I use the Domino's pizza one a lot because I, it was a fantastic um, example of a unique selling proposition. Um, and then, you know, it, again, universal concepts, you can take something like delivered in 30 minutes or it's free. I know why I'm calling Domino's right? Because I'm going to get a fresh pizza and it's going to be here in 30 minutes or I don't pay for it, right? Um, that's why I'm picking up the phone. That's what the risk reversal is too, right? If I if I pick up the phone and call Domino's. Uh, so that was really good. So it's like, you know, in real estate, we have the guaranteed sale program. Your home sold the next number of days or we buy it, right? Similar type of offer. That's a universal concept. Um, Geico, uh, 15 minutes could save you 15% on your insurance, great. right? That's a great one. Yeah, it's a good one because, you know, I know why I'm picking up the phone to call, like, let's say a company like not a Geico commercial, but calling Geico because I know that I'm what to expect. I'm going to spend 15 minutes on the phone, but the payoff is 15% savings, right? So the concepts and, and the articulation of a USP is universal, regardless of the industry. You can take something like that and plunk it down in whatever business or service industry you're in. I think it's fantastic discussion. I'm really glad we broke that down. And, and we did touch on it. We, you know, we were talking about the lifetime value of a client and referrals. Uh, I think it's really important to touch on that. Why is it important to zoom out and think about the lifetime value of a client. And to that end, why is it important to communicate frequently with existing clients, past clients, based on the concept of knowing what the lifetime value of a client is in your business? If you say, okay, I'm a professional in real estate, and then you look at your industry and you say, where's the real opportunity in real estate? It comes from referrals and repeat, right? Okay. How do you get referrals and repeat? Well, the 
ludicrous, if you don't mind me saying it, assumption is you do a good job and they remember you. The truth is you have to stay in their mind meaningfully. And that's not just sending a calendar. But here's the irony. People, they they don't look at acquisition costs. What it costs you to get a lead and, and what it costs you to convert X leads to a transaction could be thousands of dollars, right? The sale made you a multiple of 10 times that or whatever, 20 times that or five times that. But nobody will understand that the opportunity begins. We we talked offline about people think that it stops that like first mile, last mile. It's not true. That's the beginning, not the end, David. Does that make sense? Or is it? Listen, Jay, I, you know, I don't want to be too, uh, flip I like I don't want to be too presumptuous about this but it's like we have the same brain and I'll tell you why I'll tell you why uh we do a com- commission workshop with the agents nationally and one of the things we talk about when it comes to the lifetime value of a client um is the cost to acquire now a lot of people don't know this and people listening if you if you're in the real estate industry which a lot of our listeners and subscribers are the lifetime value of a client is actually eight transactions okay on average, they've done studies on this. It's about eight transactions. Now that's if you nurture uh, your leads properly, you stay in front, of, in front of them meaningfully, as you said, okay? So if the average commission, I use a round number like 10K, let's say just on average, if that if the lifetime value of a client is 80K and you're worried about an upfront referral of 25% and cost to acquire, it's pennies yeah, considering the... The lifetime value. Yeah, but here's what people don't realize. If you said, well, I can't afford it, which is ludicrous. If you could prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will get at least half of that, you could go to an investor and say, hey, will you fund $80 a year for me for half of the of the 80,000 future money I'll get? And yeah. nobody in the right mind who has any kind of, of speculative nature would say, no, I would do that, wouldn't you? Uh, it's listen again, Jay, we need people to zoom out and look at this from the, you know, the perspective of the lifetime value, not chasing the carrot and the today sale. So, so let me shock you because this is probably, you know, unfortunately, I'm a mad scientist. You may or may not know this, but over my career, uh, and this is clinical, it's not arrogant. We've created 90 separate categories of upside uh, performance enhancement that most of them are devoid of much of any investment or risk. They're just making what you do perform better. And one of the things I was massively excited about a couple of years ago, and I found that people, for whatever reason, don't really bite into this, is that most people who generate a huge amount of their income from referrals or word of mouth don't even have one formalized, systematized continuously adhered to and strategically executed referral generating process that they use other than saying, hey, you know, I'll give you a gift card or, or thank you if you know anybody. And it's so crass and awkward. It makes <laughs> me want to a referral generated buyer. They're loyal. They buy faster. They negotiate less. They're more enjoyable. They're more profitable. We have identified because I've worked in a thousand industries, not businesses over my rather long and and worldwide career, we've identified over 125, 125 referral generating system strategies that different types of industries use to drive a huge portion of their business. Even to real estate agents, I've explained that and I've given them different examples in long sessions I've done and almost nobody does it. They just go right back to status quo thinking. And I want to almost, I can't decide whether because there's a fine line in Dave, David between pathos and humor. And I, don't, I can never decide whether to cry or laugh because they make it so much harder. You know how Tony Robbins does, and, and he's a colleague of mine, and I do things personally with Tony once a year, and it's fun. But you know how he teaches the fire walk? Mm-hmm. I wanted, when I used to do seminars, and this is not a joke because it's a metaphor, I wanted to do the jello walk to prove that it's not that hard. Did you ever do it? No, but I always thought metaphorically it would be memorable. Yes, it would be. Yeah. (laughs) Be fantastic. I I think you should do that the next time you speak. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I don't do many seminars anymore. <laughs> I do uh, some keynotes and some stuff. But I mean, it, yeah. that was a different time in my life when I was uh, when I did massive seminars on a worldwide basis. It's been a long time. But anyhow, hopefully I'm giving you most. Uh, uh, listen, you're touching on something that we, we you know, we've been hammering uh, into sales professionals is the lowest hanging fruit is repeat and referral business. It's the low. It's literally you can, you know, double your production seemingly overnight if you just take advantage of that. It's not that hard to leverage the business you already have. Right. So I, I think it's a really important discussion. I think people need to think more about that. And I'm glad that you broke that down, you know, coming from you, hopefully it, you know, encourages people to actually take advantage of that. Now, one of the other things we talked about, you know, branding is the other part of that. So there's marketing and branding. Uh, we talked about mastering direct response marketing. You've done that. It's typically unbranded. However, I, I think that the really skilled companies have taken USPs and integrated it into the branding as we talked about. So in your words, what is branding or how would you define the word brand and what should the process of branding or personal branding look like? Like, I guess, you know, where should a company or individual start or what should they be thinking about when it comes to branding? You got to stand out in a differentiator that resonates with your market. And most people don't get that. And we were talking, you and I, and we said, we think people think that their USP is sticking their face on a grocery cart or, you know, sending out a calendar or a notepad or, you know, being one of a number of people sending you what the low, you know, what the, you know, the average sales are last quarter or something. And that that's going to make you stand out as somebody deserving and choosable as the go-to source. And it's really almost, as I said, fine line between pathos it's either pathetic or it's hilarious. Which one is it? Oh man, it, it, it's, you know, keep your market stats and your gift cards. No one's, you know, no one's, uh, you know, using your services because of that. Again, Jay, it's like you're, you're taking the words out of my mouth. I, I love it. You know, one of the other things you've talked about, you know, when I was preparing for this, I've heard you talk about uh, partnerships and how sometimes they perform better for individuals or companies looking for a bigger market share. Can you tell us why someone might look at exploring the possibility of partnerships when they're going to market? Well, let me put it in very graphic imagery. I have generated billions with a B of dollars of revenue for clients and myself by opting not to go to the outside market and spend a fortune trying to build what we call outer peripheral trust and take all the efforts to migrate that over a lot of funnel elements to get to committed trust, which even isn't that certain because people will commit when they're not really that confident because of, uh, you know, of extenuating or existence circumstances. But when you go to somebody who is hard won over time, the trust, the credibility with their audience, and has delivered meaningfully on whatever they've done, and if the audience profile is the same as yours, you can shorten the timeline and the sales cycle by an unimaginable amount by getting them to endorse you, promote you, make you their recommended provider, co-brand with you, whatever legally you need to do in a world where you have uh, regulatory constraints and maybe you have to do things differently. And I'm not going to get into all the options, but there's always ethical and legal ways to do it. But to give you a simple example, when I was in the seminar business, which I was in for a long time, three or four years, we did we did, and this is back uh, 30 years ago. We did $250 million, 250, comma, 000, comma, 000, comma, is there another 000? I mean, a lot of volume. And I spent out of pocket up front a total of 300. The rest was on performance because Tony Robbins endorsed me, Success Magazine endorsed me, uh, Entrepreneur endorsed me, the in flight magazines, when they used to have them, endorsed me. 25 newsletters endorsed me, three uh, big seminar companies that weren't competitive endorsed me because I helped them all and made them millions and millions of dollars. And I was able to shortcut. If you think about it, I look at everything as this in this context of an investor. 
if a bunch of influential people and an influencer is a relative term. If you're a local real estate person, an influencer might be the nail salon. Doesn't have to be the, you know, the number one person. Depends on the market you're serving. Could be a dentist, could be, you know, could be lots of different entities or individuals. But if you think about it, let's take a bigger, let's take a national influencer. He or she or that company might have spent years building their credibility, their brand. They might have a payroll of tens of millions of dollars or millions of dollars. Since they have delivered value over a period of time. People have, have dealt with them in a trusting relationship. If you calculate the tangible and intangible dollars that represents, it might be millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions. And if you did three or four or five of those, you're getting the leverage out of a million dollars, $10 million, $100 million for nothing, but whatever back end, meaning result-based compensation you need to give. And if you can't pay in cash, you do some reciprocal. And that's pretty profound. And there's a lot, I mean, we, we've got, you know, I've done training programs on it. I've got a, a, a business we're developing to just structure strategic alliances, joint venture relationships for people and recommended provider, but most people don't understand it. And it's much different than an affiliate, a superficial affiliate type one-time promotional launch. That's the outer periphery. We're talking about, well, let me give you the best example. It's old, but it will show you how profound this can be, David. And again, I'm, I'm dating myself, uh, which is okay. So I got started long ago and I was very involved in the newsletter business when it first started long ago. And I was very involved in the gold brokerage business when it started. And that is because gold was illegal for many years in the United States. And then it became re-legalized in the late seventies. So I was involved in people with people selling gold bullion, like little ingots and coins and newsletters selling financial economic, investment, uh, philosophical, political, health type information when it first started. I had this gold company and we started out when everyone else was selling gold and everyone else was selling it in ads in the Wall Street Journal and Forbes and their local newspaper and spending a lot of money to get leads that they had to work very hard to convert because nobody knew who they were. It was just some entity somewhere else on the phone. And they were making money, but it was very costly. A lead was very costly. Conversion was low. Uh, cost of sales was high. And I realized that the real audience that we wanted were the subscribers to the newsletters. They trusted these newsletters because they tended back then to be real business owners and invest investors who were tended to be more conservative. And they were free market beliefs. They, you know, like Austrian economics, it's a, a belief system that I don't want to get into, but it's a it's a, a distinction. And they subscribed to all these newsletters. So instead of wasting all our money on, on ads that were very marginal, I went to all these newsletters and we structured deals where number one, we became the recommended gold source provider. Every time they got a new new uh, subscriber, we provided them with materials they would include in their welcome package that was all about investing in what's called hard assets, gold, silver, rare coins. We also uh, got into uh, gold stocks. We then, every quarter, we, we funded a quarterly special edition of the newsletter that was the outlook for hard assets. That's the same thing. And we would pay a very qualitative and recognize uh, either uh, a columnist or an author or an icon to, uh, to author this, this special edition. And it would be very balanced and very authentic. We would also agree to underwrite uh, quarterly and on regional basis uh, live seminars that we would fund 100%. We would pay for an icon to be a keynote our president would speak and the uh, the head of the newsletter, and we would give the newsletter all the profit from the activity above cost because we wanted the audience. When newsletter in the newsletter business, David, the 
the normality is they will mail their, this is, this is before the internet, they would mail sales letters offering the subscription. It, it would run from $100 to $500 a year for a subscriber. And they would keep mailing until they, 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 they fell below break even. Up to break even, they would keep doing it. And break even to them would mean one of two things. It would either be with or without the cost of fulfilling the newsletter included, because back then I'm giving you more data than you want, but it's an interesting story. It was only about $6 a year because there were special mailing rates to send 12 issues. So it was very nominal. And the biggest cost was the marketing, the, the, the renting of a list, the printing of a letter, the mailing of the letter, the postage, et cetera. So when a newsletter stopped breaking even, our goal company would come in and I would take their their sales letter, I would make it stronger, better headline, better risk reversal, better bonus, better positioning. And we would fund it to reactivate generating subscribers for them because we had as part of our deal that we got joint tenancy of all the database. Today, if it's an email list, you need permission, but you didn't if it was a mailing list. So we would build our own leads. When it stopped working as a newsletter promotion, we would take the copy and I would modify it for the gold company because most newsletter promotions are based on a bonus, a special report identifying the 30 best stocks to buy or the mega trends or whatever. We would take that and turn it into a lead generator for our gold business because that was normally more exciting than just trying to run an ad saying, do you want to know about gold? The point I'm making, it was very integrated, strategic. Most people are short-term, superficially tactical, and there's a big difference. I hope that wasn't. Yeah, too- no, okay. and I, I do want to get into that specifically. Um, you, you touched on it, you know, when, when we're talking about partnerships and you're talking about endorsements, when I was preparing for this interview, uh, you tell a really interesting story about Baron Rothschild on the floor of the stock exchange. Do you mind uh, relating that story and the lesson it teaches when it comes to endorsements and partnerships? It was one of the stories that one of my mentors told me, and the story goes that somebody came up to Baron Rothschild and wanted to borrow back then $100,000. And he said, I won't lend you a penny, but I'll do something infinitely more valuable. I will walk back and forth with you two times across the stock exchange floor with my arm around your shoulder. When I am done, everyone in the exchange will loan you all the money you want because of the relationship of the implicit trust that occurred by him lending his implied endorsement. And if it's an explicit endorsement, it's much stronger. How powerful is that? I love that story. You know, uh, it's perception, right? Marketing uh, and sales is all about perception as well. Um, what a powerful lesson that story teaches. So I love your breakdown of that. Um, you did touch on the unlimited checkbook, the unlimited business checkbook. Um, you know, I was telling you, we just had Grant Cardone on the show and he was, he just filmed uh, a series on discovery channel called uh, undercover billionaire. And he shattered the myth of the fact that you need money to make money. Um, your unlimited business checkbook is a variation of that. You don't actually need money to make money. Uh, what is it that you do need or what is the unlimited business checkbook? Well, here's, here's, let me give you the, the concept in a nutshell with an, uh, with a case study that will blow people's mind to demonstrate. So people think they are resource impaired because they don't have enough capital or they don't have a, uh, enough product or they can't develop any, or they can't hire top marketers or digital marketers or technology or whatever. And that's totally, absolutely ludicrous. That is not true. Whatever problem you think you have, it almost always, David, is the solution to somebody's bigger problem or untapped opportunity that the other side doesn't even know they have. If you can basically identify who they are generically and then specifically and what it is, and articulate your solution, you can own the world. Let me give you the simplest example. Uh, When I was about your age, I used to travel the world. We did seminars all over China and Singapore and Malaysia and Vietnam and 
and Thailand and Bali and London and everywhere. And one time when I was in China, I did a seminar. And at the end, we would do Q&A with translation. And a young man came up to the microphone and very heartfelt said, what do you do if your business is too small and the bank won't lend you money to grow? And I said, okay, tell me more. And he said, we are a small local motorcycle manufacturer. Now, only in China, where you maybe have a hundred million populous city, would you be a local motorcycle manufacturer? And he said, if I could get money, I would, I would go all over Asia. I would, I would set up a manufacturing plant. I would open offices. I would hire salespeople. I would, I would recruit dealers and we'd build dealers in 10 or 12 countries. And I was looking at it and said, okay, well, I don't understand what's the problem. And he was very annoyed. He goes, I just told you they won't lend you money. I said, you don't need money. All you have to do is figure out who your problem is the solution for. Go all over Asia, take a road trip, Find somebody who's very significant in a non-competitive complementary type of a business who already has a huge factory that's being underutilized, has offices, has salespeople, has dealers, and partner with them. It took me, what, two minutes to explain that? So 15 months later, I was back doing another seminar. This was in the city of Shenzhen, which is their equivalent of Silicon Valley in China. And the same young man comes up to the mic and, and now he looks like the Cheshire cat. He's smiling and effervescing and happy. And he's just so, you know, very, very, very uh, exhilarated. And he said, I did what you said. And I, I spend my whole life, David, answering questions, solving problems, untangling Gordian knots. I had no even memory. And I said, well, what did I say? He told me, I said, what did you do? He said, exactly what you said. I went all over Asia when I got to Kuala Lumpur which is in Malaysia, the capital of Malaysia. I found Asia's largest lawnmower manufacturer. They had a massive factory they were underutilizing in the second shift. They had offices in 10 countries. They had sales forces. They had thousands of dealers. We made a deal where they provided manufacturing, people, everything. I just had to bring the tool and dies. And if you don't know what those are, those are the the forms you use to create the products or the assemblies that make a product that you sell. I had to guide them and train them on how to manufacture. I had to teach the salespeople how to sell to the, uh, to the dealers. He said, in our first full year together, we both made $15 million in profit by just leveraging off of that, that distribution relationship. I believe that anybody that wants has no problem growing. You don't need money. You don't need I mean, any resource someone else has. I mean, you could say, well, I can't afford an, a, 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 a consultant because they're going to want five or 10 or $20,000 a month. My answer is if you can show that consultant, that expert, a, a provable way that if they provided their expertise to you, you would first of all implement it. And if you implemented it, you could show them the, the profit it would make or the savings it would make. And if you can show them that they can get a far greater percentage of that saving or profit well beyond what their fee would be, and you can prove with certainty you'll do it, and they have certainty about the value, you can get experts all day long to do that. What an incredible breakdown. And again, you know, the value um, in this episode, I hope everybody's taking notes and paying close attention because that is, that's an incredible breakdown, the unlimited business checkbook. Now, what's interesting, Jay, is, you know, you're, you're not a marketer, you're, you're more than a marketer, you're a strategist, right? You're a strategist. And the question is, why is strategy more important than tactics or hustle even? Like, what's the difference between being tactical and being a strategist? Um, can I answer with a story? Absolutely. Yeah, well, the mic is, the floor is yours, Jay. <laughs> so I had one, one died. I had two friends many years ago who got really interested in an emerging uh, field and it was simulated diamonds. When they first came up with simulated diamonds work, which are called cubic zirconium, two of my friends both at the same time got interested in the area. One of them was a very, very famous copywriter, but he was totally tactical. 
The other was a famous businessman who was not a good copywriter, but he was totally strategic. So they both decided to go into the market. And the first one, true story, was the copywriter who was totally tactical, but a brilliant copywriter. He came up with a name for a business called the Beverly Hills Diamond Company. He wrote an absolutely amazing ad selling a one carat simulated diamond uh, called the Beverly Hills Diamond for $39 because it cost very little, but it was very beautiful, loose stone. And he ran a full page ad in the Los Angeles Times that cost $25,000 on the front of us section back when newspapers were hot. It's an older story, but it makes the point. And the $25,000 ad pulled about $45,000 of sales. And after everything, he made about seven grand. And that wasn't enough to rock his boat. So he sent out the product because he didn't want to have to give refunds. And he folded his tent and gave up. But he made seven grand. Tactical. The other guy watched that and thought he's missing the boat. He wrote an ad and he he laughingly created a company he called Van Pliss and Tiffany, which was a laughable take on Van Cleef and Arpel and Tiffany's. And he created the Van Pliss diamond. He wrote an ad that was nowhere as powerful as the good copywriter who was tactical. And his ad sold a one carat loose stone for $39. And he spent a similar 25 grand. And instead of bringing in 43,000, he only brought a little bit more than his expenditure, maybe 30 or so. And after all expenses, refunds, credit cards, he, he lost about four grand. Now that story, if I stopped there, would say that the tactical person was much smarter, wouldn't it? Because he made four and the other lost Uh, He made seven and the other lost four. So there's $11,000 swing. So one could uh, could auger and say, wow, the tactical guy was the smart one. But the story doesn't end there. The tactical guy, because he didn't really see the value, he was a a static thinker. He took his loose stone, threw it in a cheap corrugated little box with a little note saying, here's your stone. I hope you like it. Uh, And that was it. He sent it out uh, slow third-class mail. It took forever to get there. The strategic guy who wasn't as good a copywriter, who lost four grand, took his stone, put it in a beautiful, beautiful velvet pouch inside a simulated box that was made to look like wood inside a padded envelope with two documents, not a little piece of crap. Uh, uh, No, the first document was a letter from him as the president of Van Plus and Tiffany, and it said, I wanted to personally thank you for having enough blind faith to uh, take advantage of our one carat loose uh, uh, a stone offer and send your $39. What you're going to find is a, something much more magnificent than you even expect. And before you take it out of the pouch, I wanted to uh, share with you that what you're about to experience is a gemstone that is far more radiant, fiery, brilliant, and majestic than you can even imagine. It is going to be captivating, but there is one thing I need to alert you to. It might seem smaller than you imagine. It is not because we in any way, shape, or form took advantage of you. Rather, it's because in order to get this fiery brilliance, literally above and beyond that of a true diamond, we had to make it denser means it's heavier per weight. So one carat in our uh, Van Plus diamond is heavier than it, it's more condensed. And when people see how brilliant it is, they, they contact us typically and want to know if we sell larger stones that they can take to their jeweler and set in rings and pendants and necklaces and earrings. And because we, we, we used to accommodate them, and we'd watch them go to their local jeweler and pay a fortune for settings and sometimes, frankly, overpay. We decided, because we are also manufacturing jewelers, that we would set some of our most, some of our most brilliant size stones, the 10 and the 20 and the 30 carat in gorgeous earrings, necklaces, rings, pendants, bracelets, and offer them to you preset at prices that we have seen are approximately 50% less 
than the local jeweler. And what you will see in the other document I have sent is a mini catalog that shows you the items that we have ready for immediate shipment, if you like them. And if you trust us to do that, I'd like to make you a, a proposition I think you'll find very, very appealing. Number one is if you would like to choose anything from this list or from this catalog and uh, and try it out, we will not consider your purchase complete or binding on your part until you've had it for 60 days. You've, you've worn it uh, in enough places that you got just be dazzling comments from men and women alike of how brilliant and beautiful it looked. And secondly, you must take the, the item to your local reputable jeweler and ask him or her what they would charge to re replicate it in another uh, setting themselves. And if their quote isn't at least twice what we charge, we will not even begin to think we deserve to keep your money. So we will we will exchange it for a refund right on the spot. No questions asked, no hard feelings either. And oh, by the way, to reward you for your faith in the first place, if you'd like to send back the one carat stone, we will give you twice what you paid in credit for anything else you buy. And oh, by the way, we have incre included a prepaid return package you can use with your order. Now, one was tactical and made seven grand. The other was strategic. Initially, operative word is initially, lost four grand, but in the first year he made $25 million. That, David, is the difference between being tactical and strategic. Was that adequate? Was that adequate? Uh, you know, Jay, uh, only you could tell a story like that to get the point across. You know, nobody else would be able to answer that question in quite that way. So I really appreciate that breakdown. That was fantastic. I was paying close attention. Um, you know, speaking of being tactical or strategic, what commonality do you see among the successful entrepreneurs and business builders you work with? Is there one uh, seemingly, you know, singular trait? There's, there's a couple of categories of three P's, but it's, it's, a sense of passion for not what just what they're doing, but who they're doing it for, a possibility. They see, they have a vision beyond whatever they're at or whatever their industry is at, and they see the possibility. It's very real to them. Uh, you know, we teach preeminence. We teach it for many reasons. And one of it is that it's liberating. It's, it's, it's uh, intoxicating. It's, it's, uh, it's, amazingly you elevate you to a, a strata in a competitive world where you're you you're everything is a 3d movie and you can have the only pair of glasses and i see people they're not they're not you know there's an adage you, you know you walk to the beat of a different drummer they're not even playing at the same level as as the maddening crowd they're just way above it and how they see things what they're trying to do they're having a great time they're advocates of their audience they're building something that is beyond making money. As somebody told me when I started that you are rewarded in life and in business in direct proportion to the quantity, the quality, and the consistency of problems you solve and opportunities you make possible for others. And they understand that at a very high level. People that are just trying to make money are very self-limiting. It's very self-limiting because they're self-obsessed instead of externally focused, David. Yeah, like it's incredible when you break down, um, you know, I love to ask that question among people who work with the best of the best, right? Mentor to the mentors, you know, well, what do you see? Yeah, there's two other things that and I've learned from uh, great mentors I've had. One is, is a really cool, and I use this all the time and people laugh, but it's true. Hire the best and cry only once when you have to agree to pay them. Because the differential between greatness and mediocrity is, is exponential in performance and, and a value and yield. And the other is literally be committed to always grow and develop your team, your infrastructure, because the greatest undervalued asset you have is your people. Most people don't understand that 
human beings have the capacity to achieve many times more in the course of a 40 or 50 or 30 hour week than most do, but it's not their fault. They don't know how to optimize time, effort, collaboration, productivity, highest and best use. And if you don't help them, then you cannot expect them to double or redouble their value to you. But if you've got a small business, all the more reason you've got to really invest in growing and developing instead of squeezing everything out of the people that you work for. You have to realize every one of those yep. people have the same hopes, dreams, fears, challenges you do, just maybe some in a more micro, some more macro. And, and if you understand that they're hitching their wagon to your star and you're not really trying to help them shine, then it's not only suboptimal and selfish, but you're really losing out both sides. You, they, they, nobody, I, I did, I mean, I've done all kinds of fascinating explorations of performance over my life. I'm not into a good digital marketer, but I understand the human condition pretty damn well. And I did a lot of work a couple of years ago on greatness. And my, my uh, perspective, David, was that every human being with the exceptions of acts of God, you know, where they're maybe mentally impaired or, or, or come from a really bad environment, have inherently in their DNA the desire to be great. Nobody who sells wants to come into their office or business on a Monday morning and say to themselves, self, I'm going to spend all day and achieve a fraction of what I can and be crappy at it. Nobody wants to be a bad entrepreneur, a, a, a crappy leader, a, a, a horrible marketer, a incompetent value creator. Nobody wants to be a, a, a lousy father, mother, husband, wife, lover. And yet the vast majority, I don't know, 90 some percent, 95, 98 percent are mediocre. And I say, <laughs> why? <laughs> and there are about three or four key reasons, which I can share before we stop, if you want to know, or we can leave it as a cliffhanger. I would love for you to share them. I'm, I'm loving this. So I, I'm, I'm all ears. Is, is they don't understand what greatness is supposed to look like. There may be in your life or in your business, eight or eight, nine categories of greatness that you could manifest. And the first thing is figuring out what they are and they'll differ from different people. And we did we did an analysis. I don't remember Brian on the phone might uh, on the line might remember, but I broke it into eight or ten categories. But I haven't looked at it for a while. But you figure out what they are first of all, and then most people don't have a clue what greatness is supposed to feel like, express like, change in your brain, change out of your mind, your actions in any of these categories. So you need to model people that have it first of all. Then you've got to see, okay, this is what it's supposed to look like if I'm going to be a great manager, a great marketer, a great husband, a great lover, a great parent. Then you got to see where you are uh, uh, as far as the gap. But you don't stop there. You see all these gaps because normally there is what I call logjam effect. In other words, if there's eight elements in your business or eight elements in your personal life, maybe it's health, maybe it's balance, maybe it's passion, maybe it's connection. Maybe it's, uh, you know, anything. And that's impersonal. In business, it's got all these different things. Your strategic ability, your management ability, your value creation ability, your all these abilities. And, um, and, and you figure out which one more than anything else is so out of sync that you got to fix that first. So now you figure out what they are, what Greatness looks like at the at, and it doesn't have to be the peak, but you model people in your life or that you've observed that manifest those different attributes. And then you correlate it to where you are and you look at the gap. So now you know a little bit about what it's supposed to look, feel and be like, you know where you are, you've isolated the priorities. So now you know where you're trying to get to, but you don't know how to get there. So you got to figure out what's the safest way to do it. Most people, sadly, when they can figure anything out, they're so obsessed. They try to be a, an Olympic pole vaulter uh, the first time and when they want to set an Olympic record, but they have no strength, no proficiency, and they fall down and they get scared. And then they retreat to status quo. And it's very much like if you have children, you told me you have a, a daughter or a son that just got married. I have seven kids. Uh, it's when you have a little child and they've learned to, they're trying to learn to talk, walk, eat, poop, uh, speak, 
uh, ride a bike. They're terrible. They're terrible. And if they let to their own devices, they would never grow. But you have to be their advocate, their champion. You keep encouraging them. You stand them up. You put them on the toilet. You put the spoon in their mouth out of their eye. You pick up the bike that fell over. Well, you need somebody in your life to be your champion, your advocate. You don't have to necessarily pay them all. You can pay, you can pay a mentor, you can pay a coach, you can pay a colleague, but you can have somebody. But without that, you'll never get even close to greatness. And greatness is a relative term. You don't have to be Jeff Bezos or Warren Buffett or Elon Musk. You can be great relative to who and where you are in your life. But the odds are that almost everyone is far from what their own greatness potential entitles them to. And I find it very tragic that most people accept a terrible, terrible, terrible set of lower achievements and, and, and mediocrity when so much more is possible for them. Are you a new real estate agent or thinking about getting a real estate license? If so, you're gonna wanna ask about the Greater Property Group's Agent Scholarship Program. Why pay for the cost of the course yourself when the Greater Property Group will subsidize the cost for you? Make sure you reach out and get all the details on the Greater Property Group's Agent Scholarship Program. I love your breakdown of achieving greatness, you know, being a collaborative effort. I think you said hire the best and cry only once, right? You know, um, the, the role of a leader or entrepreneur is to um, play to people's strengths. So I think that's a, you know, incredible uh, takeaway. I love that. Um, just a couple questions to wrap up because, you know, again, I, I've really appreciated your time and I don't want to keep you too long, but um, who mentors the mentor? Like you mentioned that you had mentors. Who did you learn the most from or what? Yeah. I when I was young, they were all the, the great entrepreneurs that I lucked out who uh, who gave me uh, no security, but great opportunity. And I was able to observe their focus on adding value, filling voids and their passion. But then I was able, as I was very lucky. Uh, most people don't know this, but besides a thousand industries, I've helped seriously about about 300 of the top a level mostly business authors experts uh trainers consultants and none of them came to me for help with their methodology they came for help to command more value to charge more to have the market see its superiority against alternatives but before excuse me I could ever help them. They had to give me a distilled short course primer. So I got this immersive compression understanding of a multitude of different methodologies, different ideologies, different philosophies, different technologies. And it's, uh, we were talking earlier, I don't know if it was on camera or off about there's two kinds of knowledge. There's expert knowledge, which can easily be taught. And then there's tacit knowledge, which is the, the total integration, culmination, combination of all the real life experiences that you have encountered over a life or a career or both brought together that you access. And it has it is it is driven by uh, critical thinking, consequential thinking, strategic thinking, pattern recognition. There's nine levels of that. And it's a it's a very interesting place because I have been very blessed in a very unique way, just being clinical to understand a lot of man. And I can teach a lot of it in the expert side, but I can't teach the understanding that is experiential, intuitive, you know, consequential and things like that. So it's a very fascinating, I don't know if I over Experience. No, no, no. You, well, you're, you're touching on it. You can only learn that with experience, right? And when you get long in the tooth, like we are, Jay, when you get long in the tooth, like you and I are, right? That's the only thing you learn with experience. And, and unfortunately, there is a, there's a fallacy. I'm going to give you two fallacies before I stop that I find ironic. There are a lot of tacticians who are very successful today and they're young. And they've never really experienced a downward market. 
nor have they really experienced the breadth of life and all the vagaries and the opportunities and the possibilities that a life in terms of business can throw at them. And I think that they, they, they will be probably a little bit more uh, humbled and also hardened if they allow themselves to do this. I think it's going to be very interesting. Secondly, and totally related but different, I have I challenge the concept of best practices. Uh, everyone thinks best practices uh, represent, you know, the mother load of, of performance enhancement. But if you think about it, if all best practices are, David, are the best practices from one or two related industries, and everyone is trying to learn them, what it really is, is it becomes from best practice advantage to standard operating procedure, doesn't it? So then you have to be the first to learn the next best and the next best. I think that you want what I always taught, which is funnel vision instead of tunnel vision. The true breakthroughs in life do not usually come from inside. They come from outside. FedEx borrowed the, 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 the hub and spoke check clearing a process that a Federal Reserve Bank uses to make sure people don't balance a check to create an overnight industry. Uh, 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 Fiber optics that transform telecommunication was discovered in aerospace and borrowed. Uh, Rogaine came from uh, pimple medicine. Viagra was a heart medicine. The most successful baby buggy in the country borrowed the collapsible uh, wheel from an airplane. But the real breakthroughs really don't come from inside an industry. That's why I try to get people to travel outside their industry for discovery and be curious because that's where you're going to gain the greatest advantage. I could not agree more. Uh, that's kind of what we do as well. We go outside the industry and bring the principles back. So I, I, I love your breakdown there. Okay. Two uh, wrap up questions. Uh, these are fun ones, Jay. These are fun ones. Okay. If you could have dinner with any three people in history, past or present, who would they be and why? Wow. I'm obsessed with Socratic interviewing, so I would have liked to have met Socrates. I don't know if, if he would have been a, a nice person, but I'm interested in Machiavelli mm -hmm. and Da Vinci. Wow. That's a, imagine that dinner table, Jay. So we've we got Socrates, we've got Machiavelli, and we've got Da Vinci. Yeah, I think that'd be interesting. That'd be a great, that'd be great. Um, now, uh, final question before we ask what your current projects are. Um, what A lot of talk recently and, you know, a lot of the, um, you, you know, I, I talked to very, a lot of very successful people about legacy. When all is said and done, what does the Jay Abraham legacy look like? What do you want to be known for? Well, it's interesting because I didn't set out to do this, but I, I, you know, before I stopped being really aggressively into training and seminars and traveling, we helped billion, billion, millions of people around the world. We've done it everywhere, Japan, China. I think that I have helped a lot of people, not as many young ones, but a lot of people learn how to be preeminent, learn how to add more value, learn how to fall in love with their market, learn how to be greater entrepreneurs learn how to gain greater joy out of the process and give greater joy through the process and make life a lot more purposeful. I think I've taught people who have committed a life to a business or a career or a profession how to get a lot more from it ethically. I think I have helped people, I'd like to hope, be better human beings, be better fathers, mothers, husbands, wives. I don't know if I help them be better lovers, but appreciate each <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that's pretty cool. If I had a druther, I haven't really spent much time on younger people under perhaps 40. And I probably should do that in these, this part of my life because I think, uh, you know, I'm not very good in digital marketing, but I have a lot of people who do digital marketing that come to me and they tolerate my uh, ineptitude because if they can tell me what it's supposed to do, I can give them ways to do it better or communicate it better but they have to translate it to digital marketing ease because I don't even turn my computer on most of the time other than something like this. But yeah, I mean, I think that I'd like to hope that 
my work carries on. I think the laughable thing, and, and I'll tell you this, uh, which is funny, as I talk to you right now, I have 63 serious clients around the world. I'm a principal in seven different masterminds. One has 2,000 members in Japan. Another one has 1,000, 1,500 in uh, Japan. Another one has a small group, but it's expensive in France. One is in Spain. Uh, three of them are dental, dental, and one is a hundred thousand dollar one with the number one guy in the world in Chinese energy. A really interesting guy is Tony's. Uh, it's Tony's guy. He used to be Werner Earhart's guy. He's done a lot of uh, pro athletes, and a lot of people who are young think that I have sort of disappeared off the earth, and I'm an old calcified. <laughs> A person rocking on the steps. Knock it off, Jay. Knock it off. <laughs> and, and I'd like the ability to, no, I don't mean that negative. I'd like the ability to reinvigorate people with an awareness that there are certain universal principles that are enduring. They're immutable. They have to be altered, modified, interpreted, adapted, adopted, uh, extrapolated differently for today. But human beings are human beings. And if you understand with, with clarity the powerful drivers of the human condition and you don't try to game it, you try to, uh, you know, to embrace it and to uh, contribute to it, you can own the world. And I think that's a good message that I hope I leave to the world. But, you know, we'll see. Well, listen, Jay, you've been a huge influence on me. That's a fact. Um, I'm a student of all things Jay Abraham, uh, personally. Okay, so what? final question here. What current projects do you have on the go or where do you want the people to go to learn more? We have a couple of things we're doing. I've been through eight downturns, so we're getting ready to teach people how to recession-proof a business. Years ago, we sold a $1,000 book on it, and I'm uh, developing new methodology because I don't think a lot of people have really been through a lot of downturns, and there's more opportunity Mm -hmm. uh, for prosperity and growth, if you know what to do. Number two is I'm working on a really interesting book with a guy you probably, maybe you don't, Roland Frazier. And it's all about, the title of the book is Creating Business Wealth Without Risk. And the subtitle is How to Earn the Income of a Lifetime Every th Three Years. And the premise is why start a business from scratch or try to grow a typical business conventionally when starting a business from scratch has a one in 20 uh, first year success rate, which is only 5% and a, and a one in 10, 10% a five year. In fact, you can acquire an underperforming business without using out of pocket your own money. There's 200 ways to do it. And then I've got 90 ways to blow up the profit. And then you flip it for an, a tremendous payday. And then you rinse and repeat. That's interesting because we're doing it because we want deal flow. I want participation. I've changed my model. We used to do just very large fee income. And now I'm looking constantly for interesting businesses with enough moving parts in their revenue system that I can leverage it up and participate. You know, we sometimes get a big fee again. Sometimes we waive the fee. It depends on the deal, but I'm always looking for that. I'm working with a prominent, prominent executive coach who turned around Adidas He's doing, he's doing the executives of Nike. He did the chairman of the New York Stock Exchange, the, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and some very sophisticated people. We're working on teaching entrepreneurs, serious ones, how to build legendary companies. That's interesting. And then we're thinking about taking my body of work and creating tactical training. For example, three-way to grow business training nine drivers of, of uh, geometric, uh, excuse me, of exponential profit training, power Parthenon training, joint venture training, because my work is so expansive and deep that it intimidates people. And um, we're working on one more thing, which is interesting. There's, there's uh, a prominent person in the investment world named Anthony Scaramucci, and he and I have been working on a book that keeps changing, but originally it was going to be titled uh, The Alpha Life. And it was the premise was to take hedge fund ideology, which is asymmetric upside, outside performance and de-risking the downside and overlaying those philosophies in every facet of your business and life. But in 
in exploration of it, we realized that part of the, the premise is enjoying like mad this wonderful thing called life we've been given. So the working title now is enjoy the process because we all know how it ends. Oh my God. That's a great title. Um, and my so God, Jay. Working on a yeah. lot of things that are interesting. We also have one more and it's called the Promethean CEO. And the concept is these are Promethean moments. If you understand Greek mythology, Prometheus was a Titan that climbed up to Mount Olympics and stole fire from the gods and brought it down to the populace to change forever humankind. And we believe that these are Promethean moments that entrepreneurs have the opportunity to tremendously capitalize on or mismanage. And without some guidance, you don't know what to do. So that's a lot of stuff I'm doing. Jay, you're not slowing down at all. Well, I mean, that's a lot. That's <laughs> I, David, I got married when I was 18 the first time. I wouldn't recommend it, but I had three jobs at any time. And it, what happened was I don't have a hobby. I'm not saying it with pride. My hobby is business. I love discovery, exploration. I love curiosity. I love opportunity. I love you know conceptual challenge, strategic challenges. I'm having a pretty good time at this point in my life. Jay, it's been an absolute pleasure and honor to spend time with you today. I want to thank you very much for joining us. Well, thank you. You're a very impressive person, as I said, and I've enjoyed it. And you, you've drawn out of me some interesting commentary. <laughs>